This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 67, for broadcast on the 24th of August 2018. Coming up on Space Time, a new survey shows Earth's ingredients are fairly typical. Astronomers blown away by the magnitude of an historic interstellar blast. And concerns rising as the Mars Opportunity rover remains silent. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study looking at material around distant stars suggests that Earth's ingredients are fairly typical. The findings presented to the Goldschmidt Conference in Boston are based on spectroscopic observations of 18 different planetary systems around white dwarfs up to 456 light-years away. White dwarfs are the dense stellar corpses of dead sun-like stars. These are stars which have burnt off most of their hydrogen and helium through core nuclear fusion. Once they've run out of their hydrogen and helium, they puff off their outer gaseous envelopes as planetary nebula leaving behind their exposed white-hot stellar cores, which then slowly cool over the eons of time, as white dwarfs. It's anticipated our own sun will become a white dwarf in around 5 to 7 billion years from now. The study's lead author, Dr. Jiayu Zhu from the Gemini Observatory in Hawaii, says that as a white dwarf cools, it begins to pull in some of the planets, moons and asteroids that were previously orbiting around it, in the process creating an accretion disk. And that's where things get interesting, because spectroscopic observations of white dwarfs are normally dominated by the hydrogen and helium in their atmospheres. However, white dwarfs with planetary accretion disks around them would also have the chemical signatures of the composition of the material in those disks. And by looking at those spectra, Zhu and colleagues found that most of the building blocks they observed in other planetary systems have compositions broadly similar to those of Earth. It's hard to believe, but the first planets found orbiting stars other than the Sun were discovered around a quarter of a century ago. And ever since, astronomers have been trying to determine just how similar these exoplanets are to planets in our own solar system. But it's extremely difficult to obtain spectra directly from exoplanets because their reflected light's drowned out by their host stars. It's a bit like trying to see the flame of a candle in front of a lighthouse beam. So instead, the authors selected white dwarfs which have accretion disks. They took measurements using spectrographs both on the Keck telescopes in Hawaii and on NASA's Earth-orbiting Hubble Space Telescope. The authors found that the chemical elements, the building blocks of Earth, are also common in other planetary systems. Zhu and colleagues were able to measure calcium, magnesium and silicon content in most of these stars and a few more elements in others. They may also have found water in at least one system, but have not yet quantified it, although it's likely there will be lots of water on some of these worlds. In fact, one star system, 170 light years away in the constellation Bootes, was rich in carbon, nitrogen and water, giving it a composition very similar to that of Halley's Comet. In general, though, the composition of exoplanets looks very similar to the bulk Earth. And of course, that means astronomers can pretty well expect to find Earth-like planets elsewhere in the galaxy. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have used light echoes to study a 170-year-old stellar eruption, which briefly produced the second brightest star in Earth's skies. The spectacular explosion was created by a nearby binary star system known as Eta Carinae. The event generated the fastest jettison gas ever measured from a stellar outburst that didn't result in the complete annihilation of the star, powerful enough to travel from the Earth to the Moon in just 20 seconds. The study, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, also suggests that the eruption may have caused a stellar merger, turning what was a triple star system into a binary. Located just 7,500 light years away, Eta Carinae is the most luminous star in the known galaxy. It's in the final stages of its life, and about to go supernova any day now. Eta Carinae consists of two massive spectral type O blue hypergiant stars. The more massive or primary star is estimated to be somewhere between 150 and 200 times more massive than the Sun, 
with some 5 million times the sun's luminosity, 800 times its radius, and a surface temperature of more than 32,000 degrees Celsius. The less massive companion star still has at least some 80 times the mass of the sun, and 20 times the sun's radius. Interestingly, it's even hotter than the primary star, with a surface temperature of around 37,500 degrees. The two stars orbit each other every 5.54 years, cocooned in the gigantic twin-lobe bipolar emission and reflection nebula of superheated gas and dust, known as the homunculus. Both Eta Carinae and its surrounding shroud of dust generate huge amounts of infrared radiation, making it by far the brightest infrared source in the sky. Eta Carinae will most likely undergo a core collapse supernova explosion sometime within the next half million years or so, and more likely sooner rather than later. When it does go supernova, it'll be so bright it'll be clearly visible from Earth even in daylight, and may become brighter than the Moon for months on end. The eruption 170 years ago, which produced the light echo, released almost as much energy as a normal supernova explosion would. However, in this case, a double star system remained, playing a crucial role in the circumstances which led to the colossal blast. So, over the past seven years, a team of astronomers led by Nathan Smith from the University of Arizona and Amin Rest from the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, have been working hard to determine the extent of this extreme stellar blast by observing light echoes from Eta Carinae and its surroundings. Light echoes occur when light from a bright, short-lived event is reflected off distant clouds of dust, which act like distant mirrors, reflecting light in our direction. And just like an audio echo, the arriving signal of the reflected light has a time delay after the original event due to the finite speed of light. In the case of Eta Carinae, this bright event was a major eruption of the star which expelled a huge amount of mass back in the mid-1800s during what's known as the Great Eruption. The delayed signal of these light echoes has allowed astronomers to decode the light from this eruption using modern astronomical telescopes and instruments, even though the original eruption was seen way back in the mid-19th century, at a time before modern tools like astronomical spectrographs were invented. Smith describes light echoes as being beautiful because they're the next best thing to time travel. They give astronomers the chance to unravel the mysteries of a rare stellar eruption that was first witnessed 170 years ago, but by using modern telescopes and technology. And this was very much a behemoth stellar explosion from what is a very rare monster star, the likes of which have not been seen since in our Milky Way galaxy. This outburst was so huge it expelled some 10 times more mass than our entire Sun in the process forming those bright, dumbbell-shaped glowing gas clouds known as the homunculus. The authors used the 8-metre Gemini South Telescope, the 4-metre Blanco Telescope and the Magellan Telescope to decode the light from these light echoes to better understand what actually happened during this spectacular event. REST says their Gemini spectroscopy data helped pin down the unprecedented velocities, clocking them at between 10,000 and 20,000 kilometres per second. High velocities of this nature are usually only seen in supernova explosions involving the destruction of the original star. However, in this case the star survived, and explaining how that happened has led astronomers into new territory. You see, something must have dumped a lot of energy into the star in a really short amount of time. The authors hypothesize that the only way to produce what's now visible would involve an interaction between three stars, during which two of these stars merge together to form a new more massive star, in the process giving us the binary system we see today. Understanding the dynamics and the environment around the larger stars in our galaxy is one of the most difficult areas of astronomy. Some types of supernovae have been known to experience eruptive blasts just like that experienced by Eta Carinae only a few years or decades before their final cataclysmic explosion. To find out more about this story, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson from the Department of Science. An explosion that happened about 170 years ago. What's really interesting is that we can still see it because the effects of that explosion have bounced back and astronomers today are now being uh, in a position to analyse that data, which is quite amazing. Uh, but what, what, what's the story behind this original explosion? Something weird happened from what I understand. 
That's correct, Andrew. This is really a, a story about a very, very special star. It's called Eta Carinae. It's in the Southern Sky, not very far from the Southern Cross, in fact, for those who can see the Southern Cross. In terms of its absolute brightness, that means, you know, its intrinsic brightness, it's actually the brightest star we know of in the galaxy. Is that right? Yeah. And back in, actually, it was the late 1830s that it started getting brighter <laughs> and peaked in, I think, 1843, it peaked in brightness. And of course, astronomers were observing it uh, without really understanding what was going on. But it got to be the second brightest star in the sky after the bright star Sirius, which is still the brightest star, and then started fading away. So 1843 or thereabouts, it was brighter than, in fact, its brightness was about six million times the brightness of the sun. So, really? Wow. Yeah, it's not, you know, we're not talking about, oh, it's a little bit brighter. Mm. It was six million times brighter. It's a phenomenal object. The story then goes, I guess, forward throughout the, the 20th century when this object was uh, observed photographically and eventually with the spectrograph, the instrument that analyzes the light from target stars and galaxies. And we now know, particularly from Hubble Space Telescope pictures, that this star has produced outbursts of material which are glowing quite brightly in a nebula cloud of gas around the star itself. And in fact, even with a modest sized telescope, you know, relatively I suppose a relatively small amateur telescope, not something that most people would have. It would be the, rather the province of amateur astronomers. But even with a telescope like that, looking through it, you can see this kind of orange glow, which is the, the nebula that is being illuminated. Back in the 1970s, a friend of mine who sadly is no longer with us, who was a great astronomer and a great popularizer of astronomy, David Allen, his name was. His, his name is enshrined now in the David Allen Prize, which is an award for science outreach by the Astronomical Society of Australia. He was one of the first to speculate that this object was actually a double star. It was two stars interacting with one another. Okay. And that's somehow that interaction produce the colossal energy. But nobody could really work out, and certainly David couldn't back in the 1970s, why it went through this massive outburst period in the 1830s. So, you know, 170 years ago from mm. where we stand now. But as exactly as you've said, modern technology has come to the rescue because we now have telescopes and instruments that are sensitive enough, not only to see the direct light from an object like this, but also to see the reflection of its light off nearby dust clouds. And while those dust clouds are nearby, relatively speaking, they're far enough away that, that the light travel time, because it takes a dog leg path, is 170 years. So the direct light is what we see. But if you put a dog leg in the path by reflecting that light off a dust cloud, then as has happened now, that allows you to see back exactly what was going on 170 years ago because the light travel time has been increased by 170 years. You're looking puzzled. No, Andrew. I'm not. I'm just thinking of the situation. <laughs> so you've, you've, you've witnessed the event with direct path of light. Exactly. And be, be, because the light travels out in all directions, all directions. Yeah. Uh, some of it has bounced off uh, something like a cloud and then hit Earth and it's travelled almost twice the distance or thereabouts or whatever. Well, it, in fact, it, yeah, that's right, or whatever, yeah. It, it, actually, I should say this thing is about, I think it's round about 6,000 light years away. Wow. So what you do, so it's already, you know, the light that you see directly has taken 6,000 years to get here. This dogleg path that is taken because light reflects off a nebula is only adding 170 years to that, but it's enough to let you see the outburst. I think this is an almost magical technique and it's been used a lot. And David Allen actually was one of the pioneers of this type of observation back in the uh, with supernova 1987a it's called a light echo and in fact i've been writing about it recently for a, a new book that i'm working on because i think it's just sensational that you can you can look at something and see the same light as was seen you know hundreds of years ago but it's taken this long way around and you can now analyze it with the equipment that we've got today that's and so amazing. that's it is it's spectacular. I think what I'm hanging out for, and I'm sure this will happen, there was a, an exploding star 
uh, that created something we call the, the Crab Nebula, which is in the constellation of Taurus. Yep. And that star exploded in 1054. It was witnessed by Chinese astronomers. But I bet within the next five years, there will be new telescopes which can actually see the light echo from that. And that will allow astronomers to analyse the light that was being produced when this thing exploded. So this suggests that light from various events in history is still bouncing around out there. And exactly. Who knows what we can find? Exactly right. It's it's all, you know, the universe is full of these echoes. But back to Eta Carina, yes. um, what's happened is the light echo has been observed. So we've seen the light that it was emitting when it was at its peak back in 1843. And guess what? It tells you that there's almost certainly a third star in that system a third that, colli star? that collided with the the big the big bloated star ah. basically was gobbled up and uh, the the explosion uh, sent out a shock wave which interacted with the material around it and produced this uh, massive increase in brightness so it's a wonderful piece of detective work using this light echo technique which i think is just great the larger component of the star is very unstable and is massive and almost certainly will wind up as a supernova a, a star that explodes like the you know the one in 1054 that will produce an explosion that would be very spectacular almost certainly visible in the daytime sky mm. uh, be so bright it would release clouds of neutrinos and other subatomic particles hopefully we would be far enough away from it that we won't be fried but it would still be a spectacular event that's dr fred watson from the department of science speaking with andrew dunkley on our sister program space nuts and this is space time i'm stuart gary There's still no word from NASA's heroic little Mars rover, Opportunity. Oppie, as it's affectionately called, went silent on June the 10th as the red planet was enveloped in a global dust storm. The massive storm dramatically cut the amount of sunlight reaching the golf cart-sized six-wheel rover's solar panels needed to charge Opportunity's batteries. More than two months later now, scientists think the storm is finally starting to decay meaning the sky should start to clear enough for the 15-year-old rover to recharge and phone home. Of course, the big problem is no one knows exactly how the rover's surviving until such time as it does try to make contact. Mission managers are optimistic. They've performed several studies on the state of the rover's batteries before the storm and the temperatures at its location. Because the batteries were in relatively good health before the storm, there's not likely to be too much degradation. And because dust storms tend to warm the environment, and because this storm happened as Opportunity's location on Mars entered summer, the rover should have stayed warm enough to survive. Engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, are now looking for lower tau readings. Tau is a measure of how much sunlight is being blocked from reaching the surface. The higher the tau, the less sunlight's available. The last tower measured by Opportunity was 10.8 on June the 10th. By comparison, an average tower for this location on Mars would usually be about 0.5. Engineers predict Opportunity will need a tower of less than 2 before it will be able to recharge its batteries. That's of course assuming the solar panels themselves aren't caked in thick dust. A wide-angle camera on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter will watch for surface features to become visible as the skies clear, thereby helping scientists estimate the tau. Several times a week, NASA's Deep Space Communications Network in Goldstone, California, at Canberra and in Madrid, Spain, will attempt to talk to Opportunity. The massive Deep Space Network antennas ping the rover during scheduled wake-up times and then listen out for signals sent from Opportunity in response. But so far, it's been silent. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Radio Science Group also uses special equipment on the Deep Space Communications Network antennas, which are capable of detecting a wider range of frequencies. So each day, they record any radio signal coming from Mars over most of the rover's daylight hours, then search the recordings for signs of opportunity. So, what's likely to have happened? Well, when Opportunity experiences a problem, it can drop into a number of different fault modes, where it automatically takes action to maintain its health. Engineers will prepare for three possible key fault modes. Firstly, there's the low-power fault mode. Engineers assume the rover went into a low-power fault mode shortly after it stopped communicating on June the 10th. This mode causes the rover to hibernate, and then wake up periodically to see if there's enough sunlight to let it recharge. If not, it goes back to sleep and tries again later. A more serious problem is the clock fault mode. 
If this happens, the rover doesn't know what time it is because its onboard mission clock has failed while in hibernation. Consequently, it doesn't know when it should be attempting to communicate with Mission Control back on Earth. If this happens, the rover is programmed to use environmental clues such as an increase in sunlight to make assumptions about the time. More serious again is an up-loss fault, and this could mean the communication system on the rover has simply stopped working. When it experiences this, Opportunity undertakes a self-diagnostic, checking equipment and trying different ways to communicate with Earth. Now, assuming mission managers do finally hear back from Opportunity, there could then be a lag time of several weeks before they manage to re-establish communications. And it may be several communication sessions before engineers have enough information to take action. Of course, the first thing to do is learn more about the state of the rover. The Opportunity team will ask for a history of the rover's battery and solar cells and take its temperature. If the mission clock's lost track of time, it'll be reset. The rover will then take a whole bunch of selfies to see whether dust from the storm may have caked on sensitive parts and test actuators to see if dust slipped inside, affecting its joints. Once they've gathered all this data, the team will then take a poll about whether they're ready to attempt a full recovery. And even if they do hear back from Opportunity, there's a real possibility the rover won't be the same again. The rover batteries could have discharged so much power and stayed inactive so long that their capacity is reduced. And if those batteries can't hold enough charge, that'll affect the rover's continued operations. It could also mean that energy-draining behaviours like running its heaters during winter could cause the batteries to brown out. Dust isn't usually much of a problem. Previous storms have plastered dust on the camera lenses, but most of that will shed off over time, and any remaining dust can be calibrated out. The Mars Opportunity rover was launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida on July 7, 2003, three weeks after its twin rover Spirit. Opportunity landed in the Meridiani Planum near the Martian equator on January 25, 2004. Spirit had touched down three weeks earlier in the Gusev crater on the other side of the red planet, both rovers were only designed to operate for 90 days in the harsh, freeze-dried Martian deserts. But both continued operating for years and years. In fact, Spirit continued operating for 2,269 days until finally getting bogged in a sand dune with its solar panels pointing away from the sun. Even then it continued operating as a stationary science platform, sending its final message to Earth on the 22nd of March 2010, more than six years after its landing. And of course, opportunities continued operating even longer, now covering well over 5,300 days and counting on the Martian surface, examining rocks and minerals, and travelling more than 45 kilometres to its current location in a valley leading off the rim of Endeavour Crater. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. SpaceX has successfully launched a new telecommunications satellite into orbit. The flight from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida used the same launch vehicle first stage, which undertook the maiden flight of the new Block 5 version of the Falcon 9 back in May. Falcon 9 is in startup. Go for launch. Falcon 9 is the flight pressure. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off. Coming up next, you'll hear Max Q. Vehicle's experiencing maximum dynamic pressure. That's the point at which the stresses on the Falcon 9 are highest than they are at any other point during the flight. Back engine chill. Everything is looking nominal right now. Now coming up, you're going to have three events happening in rapid succession. The first is MECO, which stands for Main Engine Cutoff. That is where all nine of the Falcon 9 first stage engines will shut down. That'll be followed by stage separation. That's where stage one will separate from stage two. And and then we'll have SCS-1, or second engine start one. That is where that MVAC engine, that, vac, that Merlin vacuum engine on stage two, is going to ignite and carry stage two onto orbit. We hear that MVAC chill is looking good. That's where we bleed a little bit of that super cold liquid oxygen into the engine. The sun shut down. Eco. Stage separation confirmed. We've had a successful stage separation and ignition. 
of that second stage MVAC engine. Now coming up in about 25 seconds, we're gonna have fairing deploy. So those fairing halves are gonna split away from stage two and make their way down to Earth. And stage two will continue on with the Mirad Petit satellite onto its parking orbit. MVAC-D had a really solid startup and all of the temperatures are looking really good. The burn is going nominally right now. We just had a successful separation of that fairing. Once we get into the vacuum of space, we don't need it anymore, so we get rid of that extra second mass. Stage is following a nominal trajectory. And as you just heard, second stage is on a nominal trajectory. Now, there are going to be two stage two burns for this mission. The first is this one that is taking the spacecraft to its parking orbit. Acquisition of signal Once it Bermuda. shuts down, it'll coast for about 18 minutes before relighting over the equator to raise Mira Petit to its deployment orbit, the geostationary transfer orbit. Now, while stage two is doing its job, stage one, it's making its way back home down to Earth. After completing its launch, the first stage returned to Earth, landing aboard the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. It'll now be prepared for a third flight. Built by Space Systems Laurel in Palo Alto, California, the 5,800 kilogram Meriputi satellite will replace the aging Telcom 1 spacecraft that failed a year ago. The new bird uses an SSL 1300 platform equipped with 60 C band transponders, providing telecommunication services across Indonesia and India. The mission was the 15th launch for SpaceX this year, coming less than two weeks after the last two Falcon 9 flights, one from Vandenberg and the other also from the Cape. SpaceX's next flight, another from Cape Canaveral, will be the Telstar 18V telecommunication satellite slated for later this week. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study claims that eating carbohydrates in moderation seems to be optimal for health and longevity. The findings, reported in the journal Lancet Public Health, is based on observational evidence of more than 15,700 people across the United States. Researchers found that both low- and high-carb diets were associated with a small but significant increase in mortality. However, moderate consumers of carbohydrates had the lowest risk of mortality overall. Researchers found that low-carb diets replacing carbohydrates with proteins and fats from plant sources were associated with a lower risk of mortality compared to those that replaced carbohydrates with proteins and fats from animal sources. In the largest study of its kind yet, scientists have confirmed that guys who wear boxers have higher sperm concentrations than those wearing tighter-fitting underwear, such as trunks or briefs. The findings, reported in the journal Human Reproduction, showed that as well as better fertility, boxers also led to lower levels of follicle-stimulating hormone compared to dudes who usually wore briefs or other tight-fitting underwear. Follicle-stimulating hormones stimulate sperm production and kicks into gear when it's needed to compensate for testicular damage caused by increasing scrotal temperatures or decreasing sperm counts and concentrations. A vigilant citizen scientist, together with Museum's Victoria paleontologists, have discovered fossil evidence of a giant prehistoric shark that once roamed the waters of Victoria's surf coast. The fossils found in the boulder at Janjunk included 7 centimetre long teeth from an ancient shark known as Cacaracles augustidens. The size of the teeth suggests the shark could have been around 9 metres long. Now, by comparison, Cacaridon cacarius, the modern-day great white or white pointer, commonly grows to around 6 metres or 18 feet, with a usual weight of just under 2 tonnes, although reports of great whites reaching 7 or 8 metres in length are not uncommon. In fact, both the Guinness Book of World Records and ichthyology textbooks have listed at least two great white sharks being much larger than this. Back in the 1870s, a 10.9 metre, 36 foot long great white was captured near Port Ferry in southern Australian waters. And in the 1930s, an even larger 11.3 metre great white that's 37 foot long was captured in New Brunswick, Canada. However, it's worth pointing out the science supporting both those claims is missing. Augustidens stalked the southern seas of Australia around 25 million years ago, and the new discovery represents only the third set of Augustides fossils ever found. Teeth from several six-gill sharks were also recovered, providing rare evidence, according to the paleontologists, that they may have been feasting on the giant shark after it died. Augustidens lived just 2 million years earlier than Cacaracles megalodon, the 20-metre-long monster shark that roamed the world's oceans between 2.6 and 23 million years ago. 
A new study has found that Australian university students give far more credit than previous generations to the science of human evolution and far less to creationism, divine guidance, or as it's called these days, intelligent design. The 32-year-long study reported in the journal Evolution Education and Outreach provides an overview of annually assessed student opinions. Researchers found that a belief among students that an omnipotent, all-knowing God being a creator or designer of human origins has steeply declined from being the major view back in 1986 to being only a tiny minority view in 2017. Conversely, conviction that humans evolved without any divine involvement of any kind rose steeply over the same period to become the dominating view among students today. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. You see, science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a great steaming pile of woo. That's what scepticism and evidence-based science is all about, a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. More fake science news claiming proof of a link between mobile phone use and cancer has made its way into the mainstream media. Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics, has the story. This is a Guardian article that was written by uh, David Robert Grimes, who is a physicist working in cancer research. Yeah. He analysed and responded to an article that was published a week earlier in The Observer, which is a sister publication of The Guardian. The original article linked mobile phone use to cancer and suggested that telcos suppressed the evidence for this link. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, well... Uh, Grimes analyzed the claims and the evidence and showed that the article was a nonsense, though he didn't quite use those words. As we ourselves discussed some time ago, there is no evidence that mobile phone use is linked to cancer. And indeed, there is no known mechanisms that would lead to such a link. So he's analyzed it. He's done a very good job. But the most important sentence in his article is actually related to skepticism, to quote it. The authors conclude by stating, quote, a lack of definitive proof that technology is harmful does not mean that technology is safe. Yet the wireless industry has succeeded in selling this logical fallacy to the world, end quote. Such a statement raises questions regarding their grasp of the term logical fallacy. The onus here is on the authors to prove their assertion. It is sheer logical contortion to present the lack of evidence as a superficial supporting argument. That the authors attribute this lack of evidence for their claims to the machinations of a nebulous big telecom is indicative of a mindset more conspiratorial than skeptical. The reason I really like this is because it highlights something that is very important for people who, with a skeptical mind uh, to remember, and that is the burden of evidence you know, is on those making the claim. It is clearly, uh, if somebody makes the claim that uh, mobile phones cause cancer, then it is up to them to prove that claim. Now, that does not mean that a research should not be done with an open mind on whether there is a link or there isn't a link. When somebody makes a claim that there is such a link, they have to show that the claim exists, especially when the mechanism seems so far-fetched. That's Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.